Hey guys, welcome back. So now getting back into X-Men. And at this point, with getting into the introduction of the Crucible, I wanna talk about not only how it was introduced to the Quiet Council, but also how this could tie into everything that we've seen Apocalypse doing throughout Excalibur as well. So let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. Alright, so jumping right in and starting with Melody Guthrie, to whom it's really from her perspective where we discover what exactly the Crucible is. And for Melody, who's one of the siblings of Sam Guthrie, Cannonball, she's a prime example for getting into this, with her being the first candidate that we see approaching the Crucible, which essentially is an opportunity for her to get her powers back since M-Day when Scarlet Witch has said no more mutants, which at the time reduced the mutant population about 90%. And not just in the main 616, but it had effects that echoed throughout the Marvel multiverse. And this is where a lot of what we've been talking about starts to connect in a crazy way. And not to go too deep into it, but I do want you guys to keep this one thing like in the back of your mind. Because in X Factor Volume 3, I think it was, when Forge merged Nimrod's technology with Cerebro, he at the time discovered a way to look into different Earths. And when he did this while also scanning for mutant activity, post M Day, much of it came back flatlined and most likely as a product from what Scarlet Witch had done. But at the time with Forge doing this, which is much likely a behavior he's going to repeat soon because of his feelings for Mystique and Mystique recently discovering Nimrod, there's a high probability that she'll give that information to Forge so that she can either get Destiny back or fulfill her request. But also with knowing this, in addition to what we know Apocalypse is working on within Excalibur, with him now pursuing the Starlit Citadel, which once again is your center of the multiverse, and with being so, having access to the entire multiverse, which really lines things up for Melody to be like the example of the first of many. And I feel like she was a good selection for somebody for us to see go through this. Because back in Decimation, in New X-Men issue 20, which was like one example of the reaction of a number of mutants losing their powers, Melody was one that took a leap of faith believing that she still had her powers and nearly died because she didn't. And back at that time, we had seen a number of reactions from different people who had lost their powers. And even in some cases, some who didn't lose their powers and wished that they did. Whether they just wanted quote, a normal appearance or to be more human. But for Melody, she very much wishes to have her powers back. And with simply hearing the name of the ceremony which will give her that opportunity, it brings tears to her eyes. And so now from here, going over to the summer house to where we get this conversation where Scott approaches Logan. And there's a few things to take from this because one, Scott makes the attempt to reach out to Logan by inviting him out on a trip with the family. And this is also what I was referring to recently in our talks about the Wolverine series, because in this moment, there is more to it with Scott extending this branch, but also with Scott being a captain above commanders in Krakoa, at some point he had to see fit for Logan to live in the summer home. But that's the reason why we're talking about in the Wolverine series, which takes place after this conversation but in this moment where Scott said nothing, it was very much like their history and their present circumstance was just screaming in that room. But on top of that, in the more immediate situation that was happening, there was this instance of Scott feeling uncomfortable about the upcoming Crucible, and with Logan pretty much telling him like, look, if you're looking for comfort, go find a priest, to where more specifically he was referring to Kurt, which then led Scott to go seek out Kurt. But I gotta say here, like, when Scott makes his way back to Krakoa, and with doing so, looking for Nightcrawler, of course. But when he does, and he sees Cypher, Krakoa, and Warlock sitting together, and then he does a double take and Warlock isn't there, because when Scott looks back, Warlock is no longer in the chair, and it appears that he's back on Doug's arm. Which isn't necessarily a new thing, because we've seen this back when the Transmode virus was a thing, and Warlock discovered that he could physically merge with Cypher. But just with the fact of him disappearing, when Scott seeing him on Crucible Day, and I just feel like it's this weird energy with Warlock, Warlock being an alien and not a mutant to where he's like, oh, let me get out of here. Don't want to get deported. <laughs> At least that's just what crossed my mind in the moment. But with Scott making his way and finding Kurt, gazing on this beautiful view of these structures that he'd recently discovered, and more specifically as far as the tall one with the four towers, and with knowing that it's hollow, but with knowing that there are no physical doors, and word of mouth being that there's no way inside, but also word of mouth being Logan telling Kurt that, hey man, somebody with three claws tried to claw their way in, but it ain't happening. But you ain't here for me, bub. Which of course was clearly Logan. But he couldn't get through because every time he would claw at it, it would just seal itself back up. And I could definitely see this happen with Logan, who's usually just running around through Kakoa for no reason, and him stumbling upon this structure and just going ham for like 15 hours straight, and then just being like stupid structure and just walking away. <laughs> 
But in the case of Kurt, who admits that he let his curiosity get the best of him, and he takes the risk of teleporting inside with it being out of his field of view, which in the wrong circumstance can get him killed. But even in that case, like a good neighbor, the five will just bring it back. But even still, it don't mean death don't hurt. But even on top of that, lucky for Kurt, the blind jump, it worked. But when he got inside, he noticed that everything in there looked as if it had been designed by him or specifically for him, but it was all exactly the way that he would have wanted it, almost as if he had made it for himself. And initially it freaks him out and Scott pretty much just tells him like he doesn't have to look for flaws in everything. And for some things, you just have to accept them as they are. And I'll go a bit deeper into what I believe this building could be after we talk more about the crucible. But for now, just keep in mind this building without doors and the inside being modeled as if Kurt designed it himself almost as if it's a tribute. But right after this, when they begin to make discussion of the Crucible, with this day being the big day, they both express that they're feeling uneasy about this happening and watching someone die. But right after this and getting closer to around the time where the Crucible begins, we go over to Exodus, who's telling the younger children about the Crucible, why it's a thing and where exactly it came from. And it's here where he pretty much tells them the story of M-Day and Decimation, with Scarlet Witch saying no more mutants, which like I mentioned took the power of 90% of mutants, and from there he goes into a bit of the decimation that it took place after. But with this, the children also refer to Scarlet Witch as Pretender, and they cover their ears as if the sound of her name is like speaking of the devil himself. But with Scarlet Witch doing this and turning a majority of mutants into humans, Exodus tells them that she took away the mutants gifts which is exactly what the humans wanted but in response to that the crucible is a way of telling scarlet witch and the humans no more but also leading all the way up to the ceremony kurt and scott have been having a conversation to where kurt because he has a seat on the council he's able to give scott more of the inside details and he lets scott know like part of the argument with having a crucible to where a victim of m day had to fight and die and also theoretically live forever that this had to come at some sort of price because if it was free and every mutant like nearly 1 million mutants had to go through the five and be restored by Charles like one at a time like they'd have to bring back Charles from old age just to keep the wheels going like imagine how long that would take so part of it did feed into the politics but ultimately the suggestion came from Apocalypse of what we heard him say before about the humans that they hate the mutants they envy the mutants and he also brings all that here directly in the ceremony with Melody who is human at this point and Apocalypse making her identify with these flaws that humans have more specifically the jealousy and identifying with it as the first step and it's very much a process of humiliation before honor but also biblical like humble yourself to be exalted and he does the same with asking her name to where she responds with her mutant name arrow and apocalypse really makes it sink in like no that's the name of what was stolen from you and really just making the separation between what she was and what she is now and of course, this is tough for her brother Sam to watch. But when the trial goes underway to where essentially she just needs to fight long enough to prove that she's worthy. But while watching this, Kurt begins to make some of the comments about how this conflicts with his faith. Because with mutants deeming themselves to have the ability to grant others with this eternal life to where they would pretty much just continue in this life, it then begins to negate the purpose of believing in something after this life. And he makes a very valid point because if you could literally see salvation, then immediately faith is off the table because at that point you no longer have to have faith for what you don't see and he's very right about that because you would still have hope and I mean like a whole lot of hope with people just coming back right after they die but in this case with it essentially being a faithless practice Kurt finds much conflict within himself and this pretty much being the only option but in addition to this you also have like the issue of the wills which are essentially these requests that M-Day victims have made as far as how they'll be brought back and some of those requests out of those wills were like straight up ridiculous because in some cases you had mutants who wanted to come back not only with their powers but also with all the powers of Magneto and I know I said that sounded ridiculous but if I were to get in the ring with Apocalypse and fight to my death to become a mutant again, I would want a new mutant body with everything on it. And I mean like a double stack, triple omega, matter manipulating, shape shifting, Apocalypse now, Apocalypse later. Like I would want it all so I can understand it. But practically that's unreasonable, which is the main conflict between the Quiet Council and those wills. But in the case of Melody, who's pretty much just fought her heart out and her brothers in the crowd rooting her on, because when it comes down to it, he knows that this is what she wanted. And getting into the part where Apocalypse goes for that final blow, Magneto's looking like, hey, watch this part. This is a good part. But Charles is like, let me make sure she's backed up before it's too late. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. But could you imagine like Apocalypse finishing her and Charles walking out after like, OK, wait a minute. I messed up. That's my bad. Her name was Melody. I thought y'all said Melanie. <laughs> but let me stop that's so messed up 
But either way, she passes the test, the resurrection is a success, and she's born again as a mutant, once again possessing her powers, and no longer just human. And it gets Apocalypse a bit choked up. I'm like, look at you, look at you, give me a minute. And I imagine like when no one was looking, he was like deep breathing and fanning his eyes. But when he pulled himself together, he just told Melody to show the others what you've earned and what you've taken back, which was stolen from you. And this is one of the things because when everyone sees this, it's in this moment when Kurt sees this and he says that he thinks that he needs to start a new mutant religion. And with Kurt saying this, this is what takes me back to the structure which we had seen, which he believed to be perfect as if he would have designed it himself. And with hearing his comments and seeing this structure, it immediately makes me think of the Cardinal Mutants, which we'd seen in Powers of Ten, to where in that future, they had no name, they were very religious, though we didn't get any information on what religion that was. But the nameless mutant who we had seen as an example, he very much resembled Kurt, but he was referred to as Cardinal, since that was the name of his class. But also keep in mind, with Mora also bringing back the stolen Nimrod production date, but in addition to that, that crystal could have had much more information on it. Like for example, Rasputin, Cardinal the Nameless, and many of those influences could have made their way into this lifetime, which then leaves that possibility for the Cardinal influences to make their way here. But that'll do it for this one guys, just wanted to add a few thoughts because the potential buried within Don of X is just insane. But real quick, just want to give a shout out to all the Patreons, thank you guys for all of your support, and for anyone who wants more information on how to become a Patreon, I got a link down below to where you can head to patreon.com slash dopespill. But also I gotta say, before I forget, like just as an afterthought, because within Decimation, as a direct byproduct of M-Day, there were plenty of mutants who were in despair after losing their powers, but on the other hand, like Mercury for example, she was devastated that she did not lose her powers, and I would like to see a bit more of that moving forward as well, but we'll see. But either way, that'll do it for this one guys, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and we'll do it again in the next one. Alright, later.